The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. Well, after the incident at the Pool of Bethesda, Jesus concluded his reply to his inquisitors by saying he would not accuse them to the Father. They had another accuser, Moses, in whom they trusted and on whose even lightest precept they had piled their mountains of tradition and commentary. And even Moses they were disbelieving and disobeying, for if they had believed Moses, they would have believed Jesus because Moses wrote about him. If they rejected the true meaning of the written words which they professed to adore, how could they believe the spoken words to which they were listening with rage and hate? The words of Jesus were received by the Jewish leaders with deadly exasperation. Jesus had never spoken so plainly before, and the words of John chapter 5 hit us with force as we read them. It seems that in Galilee, Jesus wished the truth, respecting himself to gradually dawn on his listeners as they heard his teaching and watched his works. But it appears that here in Jerusalem, where his ministry was briefer, his followers fewer, his opponents greater, and his mighty works rarer, he had determined to leave the leaders and rulers of the people without excuse by revealing the nature of his being. And Jesus could not have spoken more distinctly than this. They had summoned him to appear before them and explain his breach of the Sabbath, but far from excusing the act itself, as he sometimes did in Galilee, by showing that the higher and moral law of love supersedes and annihilates the lower law of literal and ceremonial obedience, by showing that he had acted in the spirit in which the greatest saints had acted before him and the greatest of prophets taught, Jesus set himself wholly above the Sabbath as its Lord and as the Son and interpreter of God who made the Sabbath and who, in the mighty course of nature and providence, was continuing to work thereon. Well, the two deadly charges against this prophet of Nazareth were that he was a breaker of the Sabbath and a blasphemer of their God. The first was a cause for opposition and persecution. The second was ample justification for efforts to bring about his death. Well, at this time, the leaders could do nothing but rage in impotent indignation and melt away. For whatever reason, they felt they could not act now and doubtless a power greater than any they knew had restrained them. The hour of their triumph was to come, but from this moment they went forth against Jesus, the sentence of violent death from the hearts of the priests and the Pharisees. Well, under these circumstances, it was useless, and even worse than useless, for Jesus to stay in Judea. Every day would be a peril from these powerful conspirators. Jesus could no longer remain in Jerusalem for the coming Passover, but must return to Galilee. And Jesus returned with a clear vision of the fatal end before him. Jesus knew the hours of light in which he could continue to work were fading into dusk, and the rest of his work would be accomplished under the shadow of death. Well, the responsibility for much of this falls on the head of the paralytic man at the pool of Bethesda, whom Jesus healed in his great mercy and compassion. Jesus had now been violently rejected in his own obscure hometown of Nazareth. He had now been rejected at Jerusalem by the leading authorities of the nation. And there is a sense in which Jesus found himself between a rock and a hard place, Nazareth being the rocky place and Jerusalem being the hard place. 
Well, in this situation, Jesus chose to return to the Galilee, but it was to a Galilee darkened by clouds of gathering opposition. And he had scarcely returned before there was a terrible martyrdom like the first note of a death toll. John the Baptist was put to death. The man whom Jesus said was the greatest man born of woman, the forerunner of the Messiah, a prophet, and more than a prophet, had been murdered. On the death of Herod the Great, the rule of Galilee had fallen to Herod Antipas. Now, Antipas was a weak and miserable prince as ever disgraced the throne of an afflicted country. Antipas was cruel, crafty, and voluptuous like his father. But unlike his father, he was weak in war and vacillating in peace. Like many a similar character before him, superstition and infidelity went hand in hand. But a guilty conscience did not deter him from the criminal extravagances of a violent nature. Dean Farrar described him as a man in whom were mixed the worst features of the Roman, the Oriental, and the Greek. Well, it was the policy of the numerous princelings who owed their existence to Rome and Roman intervention in their affairs to pay ceremonial visits to the emperor in Rome. And it was during one of these visits that Antipas had been the guest of his brother, Herod Philip, who had been disinherited by his father and was living in Rome as a private citizen. And here he became entangled with Herodias, who was the wife of his brother Philip. Antipas repaid Philip's hospitality by carrying his wife off. And everything combined to make the act as detestable as possible. The Herods, the Herods carried intermarriage to an extent that only existed in the most dissolute of the Oriental and post-Macedonian dynasties. Herod was not only his sister-in-law, or Herodias was not only his sister-in-law, but also the niece of Antipas. Herodias had borne her husband a daughter who was now growing up, and Antipas himself had been long married to the daughter of Aratus, the emir of Arabia, and neither he nor Herodias were able to plead the excuse of youthful passion, if that can ever be pled. At the heart of everything world missionary evangelism does is reaching out and saving the lost through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do this through native missionaries. Right now, we have many native missionaries who need sponsors. That's right, partners just like you who will help them become full-time workers for Christ. That provides this native missionary with the ability to give his life full-time to gospel outreach. We also need Bibles. That allows us to share the word with those we reach in the mission field. If you would like to either sponsor a native missionary or provide the gift of Bibles, Simply call us at temptation was ambition, and she preferred a doubly adulterous and doubly incestuous life to a marriage to a man who did not have a fraction of a throne. 
Antipas promised to marry her when he returned from Rome, and she got him to promise he would divorce his innocent consort, who was the daughter of an Arabian prince. Well, from this time forward, a series of annoyances and misfortunes began to fall on Antipas, which ended in his death after the loss of his crown and being in exile. Herodias became the evil genius of his house from the very start. And Herod's people were scandalized and outraged. Family dissensions became bitter dissensions. The Arabian princess fled to the border castle of Machiris and then to the rocky fortress of her father at Harith in Petra. Her father broke off all relations with his former son-in-law and subsequently declared war on him and inflicted a ruinous defeat on Antipas. Well, things got worse. In the gilded halls of one of the palaces that the Herods delighted to build, the dissolute tyrant tried to shut out the murmurs of his subjects' indignation. But there was one voice that did penetrate the darkness and reach Antipas, and this voice stung his conscience and would not be silenced. It was the voice of John the Baptist. Now, we really don't know much about how John the Baptist and Herod Antipas first came into contact. Hollywood movies have presented a picture of Antipas and Herodias in their public carriage being denounced by John the Baptist, but this is just Hollywood theatre. What we do know is what Luke tells us in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Licinius being the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he, that is John, came into all the countries about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. Then said he, that is John, to the multitude that came forth to be baptized by him. O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and don't begin to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also is the axe laid to the root of the trees, and every tree therefore which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? John answered and said to them, He that has two coats, let him impart to him that has none. And he that has meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said to him, Master, what shall we do? Remember, publicans are tax collectors. John said to them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said to them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content 
with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and he will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached he, John, to the people. But, Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by John for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. Herod's excuse for seizing John was that his preaching and the crowds that flocked to him tended to endanger the public safety. But there was also in Herod a superstitious curiosity that led him to hanker after the truths of religion which his daily life so flagrantly violated. Herod summoned John to his presence. And we can only speculate as to what that confrontation must have been like, John standing fiercely before the king in his hairy cloak and leathern girdle. His words were the simple words of truth and justice that fell like flakes of fire that alarmed Herod. Herod was convicted, stirred, and troubled in his heart by the words of this wild man, John the Baptist. World Missionary Evangelism, through its wide variety of mission outreach programs, is an evangelical force in developing nations, and it all begins with native missionaries. Called by Christ to do His work, our native missionaries are first and foremost soul winners. Often facing hostile opposition, they have the courage to reach out in compassion to the lost, sharing the good news with those in their communities. But that is just the beginning of WME's evangelistic programs. World Missionary Evangelism reaches children through vacation Bible schools and Christian schools. So even as we feed the hungry bodies of little ones, we also feed their souls. For almost six decades, WME has been building churches in both urban and rural areas. Most of these churches are used every day of the week and become beacons of light in the areas where they serve. Churches not only provide worship opportunities, but they also offer a community gathering point, education, child care, and even serve as feeding centers for the hungry. WME not only sponsors native missionaries, we train them. World Missionary Evangelism has local pastoral education programs for new missionaries and continuing education programs for those who have been in the field for years. WME also has Bible colleges that provide degree programs for those seeking a fuller knowledge of the Bible and Christian outreach. The evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of our name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is at the heart of everything we do. Well, Herod may have been alarmed by the fulfillment of the old curse of the Mosaic law in the childlessness of his union with Herodias. Maybe he listened with some feeble hope of future amendment. And Antipas might have done things gladly for John, but there was one thing he would not do, and that was to give up the addiction that mastered him or dismiss the imperious woman who ruled his life after ruining his peace through war with Aratus, the prince of Arabia. John's declaration was blunt. 
quote, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Not that John or the Jews could enforce compliance with the law of Moses on Herod, because they could not. And none of the rest of the Jews had the courage and conviction on the matter that John did. So, the Jewish leadership hid behind the great prophet John. Now, we don't know how many times John the Baptist may have been dragged from his stony dungeon across the splendid marble floors of the palace to be brought before Antipas. Doubtless, he was pale, wasted, abused, and disappointed. Doubtless, he knew that a refusal to change his position doomed him to another term in his solitary cell and refired an implacable hatred in his antagonist. But John never hesitated to face his angry foe with a great non licit it is not lawful and most likely. John did not spare verbal judgment on the other crimes and follies of Herod's life. In our modern days and times, we would have refused to judge Antipas and would have had weasel words for the sins of the leaders, but not so John. The prophet was made fast by the long asceticism of the wilderness such that he had no dread of human royalty and no compromise with sin. Courage and holiness and purity stood fast to rebuke the lustful nastiness of a corrupted soul, such that the king cowered with a stricken conscience before his prisoner, even though he was in the presence of glittering courtiers and reckless men at arms. John knew there was little hope of release from his dungeon, and John knew that death was the only escape since the one he had testified to beyond Jordan or Jesus did not respond as he had hoped with a miracle of release and with the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. Well, up to this point, John had been afforded a precarious protection from the venom of Herodias by either the timidity or the scruples of Herod, such as they may have been. However, Herodias was not about to let anything stand in her way, including whatever vestige of spiritual peace was left to Herod by keeping John alive. Herodias knew that even from his prison, the voice of John was more compelling than her fading beauty and might take from her head the crown that formerly adorned the daughter of Aratus, the Arabian prince. So Herodias watched and waited knowing that sooner or later her opportunity would come, and come it did in the person and form of her daughter, the faithless spawn of a faithless mother. Well, Herodian princes like Roman emperors were addicted to magnificent anniversaries, victories, and such occasions. The Herods had adopted the heathen fashion of birthday celebrations, and Antipas on his birthday, either at Machaerus or at a neighboring palace called the Julius, prepared a banquet for himself and his retinue. Now the wealth of the Herods and their tendency to host extravagant displays made certain that nothing would be wanting if money could procure it. The party would be in the depraved fashion of the empire, mingled with Roman sensuality. But something else was to be added. And that was a something that Antipas could not and did not anticipate. Herodias provided the king with an unexpected and exciting pleasure, a spectacle that would enrapture his kind of guests. Dancers and dancing women were in great demand in Herod's world, and the passion for witnessing these often degrading representations had made its way into the Sadducean and semi-pagan court of these usurping Edomites. Herod had constructed a theater in his palace for such performances. A luxurious feast of these times was not regarded as complete unless it closed with some gross exhibition. But Herod had not anticipated the rare luxury of seeing a princess, his own grandniece, 
a granddaughter of Herod the Great and Mary Ann, and a descendant therefore of Simon the high priest, and the line of Maccabean princes, a princess who afterwards became the wife of a tetrarch and the mother of a king, he hadn't expected to see her honoring them by degrading herself into a scenic dancer. But when the banquet was over and the guests were full of meat and flush with wine, Salome herself, the daughter of Herodias, in the prime of her youth and beauty, executed a parcel, or a one-person dance in the midst of dissolute and half-intoxicated revelers, which pleased Herod, as the scripture so delicately puts it. In a delirium of drunken approval, Herod swore to this degraded creature in the presence of his guests that he would give her even to half of his kingdom. So Salome's dance had excited Herod. And in a fit of foolish extravagance, Herod promised Salome anything she wanted up to half of her kingdom or half of his kingdom. Well, Salome raced to her mother and said, what shall I ask? Well, it was exactly as Herodias expected. Now, she might have asked for jewels or palaces or anything she desired, but to a mind like hers, revenge was much, much sweeter than wealth or pride. Many people are shocked when they discover that world missionary evangelism has been building, funding, and staffing Bible colleges for decades. These institutions of learning offer those called to preach the gospel and share the good news, an educational foundation to better serve God and man. In the courses taught by experienced instructors, students grow in biblical faith and knowledge as well as in all facets of mission, outreach, and work. The tools provided by these colleges help build roads of understanding that enable our sponsored missionaries to reach countless souls. Bible colleges, therefore, are just another example of the fact that the evangelism and world missionary evangelism is not just part of the name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is the heart of our work.